Hi everyone, this is Amy Johnson Crow, and welcome to this week's Archives.com live stream. This week we are going to be talking about what are you missing in death records? And genealogy is one of those kind of neat things that we work with different types of records, different resources that you know people don't often think about unless they're actually doing genealogy. And death records really is one of those uh, one of those resources that you really have to be a genealogist to be excited about death records. But there are very good reasons to be excited about death records. There is so much information. There are so many clues that we can get to further our to further our research and to make more discoveries about our family history. So if since they, they are so rich in information, sometimes we can kind of gloss over a few things. So what we thought we would do today for, for this little bit is we thought we would take a look at some modern death records, some death certificates, and see what clues we can pull out of them and also evaluate the information that we're seeing there. So with that as an introduction, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so when you look at a modern death certificate, it's really easy to get excited. For one thing, you know, beyond the fact that there is so much information, it's laid out very nicely and neatly. They're often typewritten, like this one is here, so they're easy to read, there's a lot of forms, a lot of fields, a lot of great places to get information. So why can they be sometimes a little bit difficult to work with? You know, it, it's, such a, it's such a great looking form. What is it that makes it just a little bit tricky sometimes? Well, the thing about death records, and specifically death certificates like I just showed you, is that it contains a mix of different kinds of information. And we're going to be talking more about that in just a minute. But there are often clues in there that you need to tease out. Sometimes things won't be spelled out specifically. Sometimes you need to put little pieces of information together to get the full picture. So even there, there's a even though there's a lot of great information, sometimes you still need to massage it and tweak it and play with it a little bit to see what other information you can get out of it. So I mentioned a moment ago that death certificates have different kinds of information. And what I mean by that is that they include primary information. Now, primary information is something that's recorded at or near the time of the event, and it's information that's provided by someone with knowledge of those facts. But death certificates also contain secondary information, and that's information that's recorded long after the event and or by someone who really didn't have knowledge of that event. So you have primary information recorded at or near the time of the event by someone who knew what they were talking about, and also secondary information recorded long after the event or by someone who, who really didn't know. We have both of those things going on in death records. So here's that death certificate that we looked at a moment ago. And let's take a look at what I mean by primary and secondary information. The areas that I have highlighted here in the green are primary information. It's information about the death because that first it's the purpose of the death record is to record that information about the death. So the place of the death, the person's name, perhaps their residence, their gender, and their color or race you know, that's, that's, easily, that's easily told. And then the information about the death itself, the date of the death, the cause of the death, and probably the cemetery. 
as well as the name of the undertaker. So that's all information about an event that just happened. And it's being given by people who should know what they're talking about. But look at how much information on this death certificate is secondary. The person's marital status, the name of their spouse, their birth date, their age, their occupation, information about their birthplace and their parents. All of this, all of this information here in yellow, that information about the person other than their death, that information about their birth, that information about their parents is really dependent upon this person down here, the informant. Because all of that information in yellow, all of that information about the birth, their parents, all of that, that is directly dependent upon the knowledge of that informant. And if you think that doesn't make a difference, take a look at this. This is from my own research, and there are five siblings. So you would think that these five brothers and sisters would all, that all of their birth, all of their death records, excuse me, you would think that the death records of all of these siblings would name the same parents. Well, in fact, they don't. When we look at the information that was given by five different people, it's a mix of in-laws and a mix of grandchildren, we see the mother's maiden name given as either Denoon, Denon, Denude, Denoon, or even Wilson. So it really does make a difference about the, the knowledge that that informant had. You know, these are all five full brothers and sisters. They should list the same mother's maiden name, but they don't. So again, I can't stress that enough. That information, that knowledge that the informant had is going to make a tremendous difference on the accuracy of what is given on that death certificate. So make sure that when you are evaluating a death certificate, make sure that you look at that informant. Here we have an informant, Susan M. Miller. And if we look at other information on this death certificate, we see that the name of the wife of the deceased is Susan M. Miller. So what we probably have is the wife giving information about her husband. If we look a little bit more closely, we see that she does name her husband's father, but she doesn't give information about her husband's mother. In fact, she says unknown. So, you know, she, she apparently never knew her mother-in-law. But at least we have some idea of you know, who's giving this information. Chances are she knows her husband's date of birth and she probably knows his place of birth. In this case, the information about the, the husband's parents, mm, not so much, but we know who is giving this information and we can evaluate it that way. Looking at another death certificate, this one for George Brown, we see that the informant is Mrs. Daisy Gladden. And we have no idea who Mrs. Daisy Gladden is. Is this a daughter? Is it a granddaughter? Is it a housekeeper? Is it a nurse? We don't know. And we don't even have an address to compare to where George Brown was living to see if she was living in the same house. So we really don't know how accurate this information is about his date of birth, his place of birth, and his parents. On this death certificate for Edward Clark, we see that the informant is Roland Johnson. But what's interesting about this is that Edward Clark, on his death certificate, it lists his usual residence as 2520 East Elm Street. 
in Tucson, Arizona. And that's the same address as the informant, Roland Johnson. So from this, we don't know their relationship. Is it a grandson? Is it a nephew? Is it a son-in-law? We don't know. But we do see that they are living in the same house. So that gives us some clues to take a look at and also gives us an idea that, you know, they probably did know each other at least well enough for Roland to give, hopefully, some good information about Edward Clark. And sometimes you will come across death certificates, such as this one, where they didn't list the informant. So we have absolutely no idea at all whether this date of birth, the birthplace, and the parents, we have no idea how accurate that information is because we don't know who gave that information. But what we want to do, besides looking at the informant and gauging how well they knew the person and how accurate that information might be, what we want to also do is take a look at other fields on that death certificate to see if they can give us clues for further research. And here we have a death certificate for William Johnson, and it's giving us very, very basic information. He was a soldier in the U.S. Army, and it lists his birthplace as Alabama. The informant is a captain, so... You know, it, it, this information is not being given by William Johnson's family. It's being, being given by, it looks like, a doctor in the Army. But there is a clue that we can follow up on, and that is where it lists that he was buried, and that is Clayton, Alabama. So this can give us a clue when we're trying to determine if this is our William Johnson. After all, it is a very common name. But this gives us a clue that not only was this William Johnson born in Alabama, but that he was also buried specifically in Clayton, Alabama. So we can follow up and start looking for cemetery records there in Clayton and see if we can find other information that will help us further identify this William Johnson. Now here we have the death certificate for a Harvey Smith. And this is a death certificate out of Arizona. But what we have at the top of the death certificate is they are listing the usual residents. And notice that his usual residence was not in Arizona. It was actually in San Antonio, Texas. And that this person had only been in the community for 15 days. And he'd been in this hospital for five days. So, you know, even though he died in Arizona, this is not his normal place of residence. And that can make a big difference when we are looking at down below where they list the cemetery. Because it lists the cemetery as Evergreen Cemetery. And we have the name of the funeral director, Parker Mortuary, in Tucson, Arizona. So you might think, oh, well, he was buried in Evergreen Cemetery in Tucson. Well, maybe not, because there is also an Evergreen Cemetery in San Antonio, Texas. It's important to remember that, especially when we are dealing with out-of-town deaths like this, it's important to remember that that funeral director that's listed on there isn't necessarily the funeral director that held the funeral. It's the funeral director who took care of the embalming and preparing the body. So just because the funeral director is from Tucson doesn't mean that this man was buried in Evergreen Cemetery in Tucson. He might have been sent back home 
and buried in Evergreen Cemetery back in San Antonio, Texas. So again, make sure that you're looking at all of the fields on that death certificate and see if they all match. See if it makes sense. Now, any time that you have a death record, whenever you get it, it should lead you to other things to look at. And one of the obvious things to look for when you get a death certificate, since it has the date and place of death, is to look for an obituary. But are there other things you could also look for? Take a look at the cause of death. Now we saw this death certificate earlier and you might have noticed that this poor gentleman, his cause of death, homicide, skull crushed by club. What a horrible, horrible way to, uh, to die. But this gives us further ideas for more research. Not only can we look for obituaries, but we should also be looking for other newspaper articles about this man's death. You know, he, he was murdered. So, you know, are there newspaper articles about, about that murder? Are there any police reports? Are there any court records? You know, all sorts of things that we can follow up on based upon the nature of this man's death. So to recap, talking about death certificates. They contain a wealth of information. And oftentimes, you know, when, when we get a death certificate, especially for those ancestors that we've been looking for for a while, and we get all that great information about their birth and about their parents and mother's maiden name, you know, it's one of those records where we stop and we do the genealogy happy dance. But we need to remember that a lot of the information, the accuracy of that information, depends upon the knowledge of the informant. You know, how well did they know that person? Did they know what they were talking about? And look at other parts of that death record to find clues for further research. What about the cemetery? What about what is listed as their usual residence? What about that cause of death? Can those make us think of other things, other records that we should be looking for? So next week on the archives.com live stream, we're going to be taking a look at census records, specifically what happened to the names, making the jump to the 1840 census. For those of you who have worked with census records and you've gone back to 1850 and then you try to go back to 1840, you notice that there is a big difference between an 1850 census and an 1840 census. You lose a lot of names. And that's where we're going to tackle next week, is how do we make that jump back to those census records where we don't have everyone in the household listed by name. So be sure to join us next Wednesday, April 24th at 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific for What Happened to the Names Making the Jump to the 1840 Census. In the meantime, stay connected with archives.com. Make sure that you read our blog. We've got some great things going on there. Like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. And if you want to see any of our previous live streams, they have all been recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, and you can see the address right there. So for those of you who are watching this later on YouTube, join us on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. We have a lot of fun in the chat room afterwards. And for those of you who are watching live, eh, go over to the, the YouTube channel sometime and check out ones that we've done in the past. We do these every week, and we've got a, a growing number of videos over there. And we hope that you tune in and, and enjoy those. So until next week, I'm Amy Johnson Crow. Happy researching. <laughs>